Welcome, everyone. We are going to begin the webinar on vehicle electronics, the facts, the fiction, and the future. I'm Melissa Joles with RDA Impact, Frank Turlip, Senior Vice President, Global Innovation at Aztec, is your presenter today. The presentation will take approximately 45 to 55 minutes, and we are recording it, and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen, and Frank will answer them at the end of the presentation. Now I'm going to turn it over to Frank. So good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you're having a good middle of the week weekend on Wednesday. And um, in today's session, let me just make sure I got everything working here. We're going to talk about vehicle electronics, the facts, the fiction, and the future. Um, our agenda is going to be we're going to talk about vehicle electronics today. We're going to talk about scanning. We're going to talk about Aztec. And then we're going to wrap it up with a little overview of who we are, what we do, why we do it, and then invite anybody who wants to come here to visit us and take a tour. So let's talk about the vehicle electronics today, okay? And let's start out with 150 million. Now I know I can't, you're on mute, but I want you to start to think, what, what am I talking about when I bring up the term 150 million we're related to vehicle electronics. Well, the 150 million is letting you know that in a 2016 Ford F-150, there are 150 million lines of software code. Now, how does that relate to the rest of the world? Well, Space Shuttle has about 400,000, and F-22 Raptor, has about 1.7 million. Facebook has 62 million. So you can see that today's vehicles are really, really high tech. And your shops, your customers, these shops, and the technicians and the owners and managers have to deal with these now every single day. And by the way, these lines of code are all stored and connected to anywhere from 20 to 100 plus computer modules in a car. And on some of the higher end cars, there are presently more than 200 sensors. And in some cars, there are 10 cameras. So think about that. Those are the cars that are showing up in collision repair centers um, that the collision repair shops have to repair. So. So you think about today, the vehicle typically is about 35% of the cost of the manufacturing of a cost is about electronics. It's soon to be 50%. But more importantly, the new innovations that are coming out related to vehicles are mostly electronic in nature. About 95%, 90% of innovations are now coming from electronics. Now, so what does that mean? Well, that means the poor collision centers are today and will continue to have to repair computers on wheels. The other thing that what this means, computers on wheels, is this. In the technology business, which I've been in for 30 plus years, there was a thing called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law was, was very simple. It says every 18 months, the cost of the technology will be cut in half, and the capabilities of the technology will improve two times. So what's going to happen is you're going to see more and more technology get shoved in the car. The cost of that technology is going to be less. It's going to get smaller, and the capabilities are going to increase. So you take this rocket ship or this 150 million lines of code vehicle computer on wheels. So what happens when it meets an accident? Well, it's a lot different today than it was five years ago because today, if you look at that vehicle on the left, where in that car can you have an accident that doesn't affect the electronics? And if there's 200 sensors, if there's 1.5 million or 150 million lines of code, and there's multiple cameras, those are going to get damaged. And in most cases, the damage will not appear as a light on the dashboard. So what that means is a shop must perform scans, which takes us to the next step 
video scanning. So what is a vehicle scan? What is it? Well, simple description. It's the use of an electronic device or tool that retrieves DTCs, diagnostic trouble codes, and live data from a vehicle's electronic control unit. That's it. What a scan is. Okay? Now, why do we why do we complete scans? Well, there's multiple reasons. Number one, we want to do a pre-scan. And that's during the estimate or check-in process prior to disassembly. It should be part of the process. It's used to identify hidden damage in the electrical systems of the vehicle. It will increase the shop's estimate accuracy, knowing which parts need to be ordered. It will improve cycle time because you're not catching, you're not being surprised at the end of the repair, we got an S supplement. And it helps reduce fraud. So what does that mean? Well, in a lot of cases, there's an electronic footprint of previous DTCs that were not related to the vehicle that a lot of consumers, not a lot, but a percentage of consumers want to include in their estimate and repairs. Well, because most systems today will tell you when a DTC occurred, you'll know if the DTC was related to the repair or to the repair process. So that's the pre-scan. Now, the next step is the post-scan. When do you want to do that? After the vehicle's the repairs are completed. You want to first clear all the fault codes and return the vehicle electronics to pre-accident condition. Now, just because you clear the fault codes doesn't mean you fix the vehicle. So there's there's certain things you're going to want to do, and I'm going to talk about a little bit later. You're going to have to do relearning, or you have to do calibrations, etc. But at the end of the day, the post scan is there to validate that the codes have been cleared; they no longer exist, and it's also to provide the consumer and the insurer that that car, when delivered to that consumer, is clean as a clean bill of health. Now, there's another reason why you need to scan, and it's because the OEMs have gotten much more strict, much more clear on their requirements. If you go in and start to look at the recently updated OEM position statements, by the way, there's 13 here that represent most of the vehicle market in the United States, most of the new position statements do not say recommended. They say must, they say mandatory, they say required, all of that. So one of the things, if you're a collision repairer or on this call or on this webinar, or you're a PBE supplier with your collision repairers, they need to go in and look at these new position statements that are very strict and very clear about the need to pre and to post scan a vehicle. Now, what does a scan tell us? Well, it tells us just about as much as an x-ray. Now, I'm assuming there's no doctors on the other side of this webinar. And if you want, if there are, great. I don't know why you're on the webinar. But think about it. You go and you get an x-ray on your arm, your lungs, whatever it is, and, and and you're looking at it, so, and the doctor shows it to you, do you know what the x-ray that you're looking at um, is telling us? Think about it, right? I just now got the x-ray from, from my doctor. I'm looking at it. And if you're like me, you don't know what the hell it says or what it means. So in this case, think about, maybe some of you know, but what do you think you're seeing in this x-ray? Well, you're seeing pneumonia. Now, unless you were a doctor, you probably would not know that, or unless you were a lung specialist. So keep this thing we just talked about in mind, what an X-ray tells you, because it's important to the overall scanning process. So let's talk about the results of a scan. So in this case, it's a truck that was damaged, and here are the codes that were generated from the computer and the DTCs. Now, we know some of these codes that there are multiple airbag deployments. Now again, as long as you know what you're reading here, remember, it shows you a code, it shows you a description. 
As long as you're familiar with that description, you know that there are multiple airbag deployments. You also know, if you're knowledgeable, that multiple DTCs false were created during the repair process by the shop because they were disconnecting things to do certain repair procedures. Now, in this case, you have to know the you have to know the codes, you have to know the description, and what repairs or faults they're related to. So again, when you talk about scanning, it's much different than diagnosing. And that's why I want you to remember that X-ray, that X-ray slide. So if you think about the X-ray slide, when I plug in that scan tool and out comes the results, what you are doing is you are performing a simple operation that the X-ray technician would do with the X-ray. You're plugging it in, you're turning on the key engine off, and you're getting a report from the scan tool. Now, from there, if you are an educated, trained technician who understands those codes, then you can make the diagnosis. But the scanning process is a simple scan, get the information, where diagnostics is the determination, the research, and the mapping out of the path to repair. So again, think of the x-ray. X-ray technician walks you into the hospital, takes your x-ray. X-ray goes to the primary care physician. They read the x-ray. They make the diagnosis. So that's the difference between what I call scanning and diagnostics. So what's the typical scanning, relearning, and calibration workflow? Well, again, Hopefully you're following this, number one, all vehicles should be scanned before disassembly begins to ensure that you have a baseline readout of what was included in the vehicle before the repairs start and will also be used to help determine what parts and repairs you need to do to the electronics. And obviously, once you've done that, you take those fault codes and now you do research to determine what needs to be done. Now think about this. You plug into a late model car, you get 100 fault codes. How much time do you need to research A, what they all mean, and B, what you need to do to repair the vehicle properly? Because that's an important part of the process. Once that's done, you're gonna repair the vehicle. And once the vehicle repairs are done, you're gonna perform calibrations, you're gonna perform resets, you're gonna perform relearns, you're going to restore the sensors to pre-accident operating conditions. Once that's done, you're going to post-scan it to make sure that all of the codes are cleared. And then last but not least, perform the test drive and then come back again to ensure that do another post-test drive scan to make sure all of the DTCs are cleared after the test drive. Now, I'm assuming people on this call, there's, there's people using aftermarket tools. There's probably customers, probably some Aztec customers that use the Aztec. There's probably some uh, people on the call that use the OEM tools. Are they all the same? Do they come up with the same results? Well, over the last two years, we've had the opportunity to get data from an aftermarket test tool, aftermarket diagnostic tool that CCC determined was the best aftermarket tool they could find when they did a aftermarket tool uh, comparison. Now let me explain what you see on the screen here. Orange, the orange bars are showing the number of vehicle scans that we received data from during that model year. So for example, on the far right, we received 1,667 vehicle scans for 2008 vehicles. The blue bar are the number of vehicles that when we got the scan data, the OEM, I mean the aftermarket scan tool, did not communicate with or missed safety modules. So as you can see here, if you go to the left of the screen, the later the model car, the more inaccurate the aftermarket scan tool becomes. If you look at 2016, 16 
19.7% of the time, the aftermarket scan tool missed the safety module. 2017, 31% of the time. No, 2018, 31% of the time. And then on 2019, 87.6% of the time. At the best, 10.2% of the time in 2012. So one of the questions I always ask is, is it, is it okay that you have a vehicle that in 10% of the time you're missing missing the communication or you're missing being able to connect with a safety module and make sure it's all right on the vehicle? That's your decision. So now, what are some of the repair operations that you use a scan tool for? Well, obviously scanning. Obviously determining, diagnosing the, the, the vehicle's issues, which is a skilled operation, okay? Simple calibrations. There's a lot of things we can do. Uh, remote simple calibrations like steering angle sensor, um, some headlights, um, some other sensors, which we can actually do a calibration remotely. Then there's ADAS calibrations. Some ADAS calibrations require targets, while some ADAS calibrations require a test drive. In some cases, a couple of different, well, one of each. But in this case, it requires time, it requires permission, precision, and it requires space in the shop. And then you've got initialization operations you'll do. And that means getting a module to relearn how it's supposed to work. For example, headlights, or power windows, or a tailgate, all of those things or a sliding door, on the next sliding door on a, a minivan. All of those need to relearn. And last but not least is reprogramming a new or existing module with new software calibration files. Typically that would be done with an OEM tool, uh, airbags, and a lot of it, a lot of that would be done in mechanical stores. So now we talked about scanning, let's talk about some new trends in vehicle diagnostics. So since you have all these computers on, you have all these lines of code, you have all these sensors, you have all these cameras, you have all these, all this technology on the car, the next thing you've got to start to worry about is cybersecurity. Because the OEMs are scared to death that these high-end cars that are rolling computers on wheels can get hacked while they're driving around the streets. And you can see on the screen here, there's multiple ways to hack the vehicles. Now, let's talk, I'm gonna show you a real quick video here. So for those of you who don't remember, back in 2015, Chrysler was the first manufacturer to get hacked. And it was a Jeep. And I want you to take a look at this video. Here's a video, here's a video of the hacking. from Charlie Miller and Chris Balasek, a pair of hackers who have spent the last year developing a piece of software that can wirelessly sabotage the 2014 Jeep Cherokee. It hasn't been altered in any way. There are no devices attached to it. But like many thousands of Jeeps around the world, it can be remotely hacked over the internet through a cellular connection to its entertainment system that would allow someone to take over its steering, its transmission, and even its brakes. To demonstrate that, I'm going to access today's crash test dummy and drive it on the highway here in St. Louis while Charlie and Chris hijack its digital systems from Charlie's house miles away. They wouldn't tell me what they had planned, but they assured me that it wouldn't be anything life-threatening. Remember, Andy, no matter what happens, don't panic. It's not the first time I've driven a car while it's being attacked by these two hackers. But in 2013, they were in the back seat, and their laptops were wired into the vehicle through a port in its back door. Now they're sending the same sort of attacks remotely, and I have no idea what they might do. Hey, go on this back. Let's see how it does. So first we're going to turn the fan on them. Yeah, let's turn the fan on to see if he even notices. All right, all the, something just turned on all the fans and AC and stuff. I didn't do that. The trick started small. Oh, my God. There's a picture of Charlie and Chris in track suits that just appeared on the dashboard. But as I drove down the interstate, things started getting unpleasant and very loud. 
So again, for those technicians, for those shops who are on the call, I'm sure we experienced it. 2018, 2019 Chrysler's aftermarket tool won't work. And you can imagine that all of the other OEM manufacturers are working towards the same, same type of solution. Next, ADAS. It stands driver assistance system. So what is ADAS? Well, it is simply an electronic system that aids driving, aids driving, and that means steering, braking, and acceleration by observing the external environment. Now, all the OEM manufacturers have gotten together and have stated that by 2022, all vehicles manufactured in the United States will include ADAS-related systems and automatic emergency braking. 97%. Toyota and Nissan already have it. Honda already has it. Obviously, Tesla already has it. Most of the manufacturers are ahead of this timeline, but by 2022, all vehicles will have some type of ADAS-related technology on it. When that occurs, it's going to change the way vehicles have to be repaired. And so what type of ADAS stuff are we talking about? Well, forward collision alerts, lane departure warning, lane keep assist, adaptive cruise control, collision mitigation, driver status, you can read all this. For those of you who have a newer vehicle, my guess is you've already got this on your vehicle. Now, challenge is, if you have this on your vehicle and you get an accident, it has to be repaired. AAA says 31% of 2018 vehicles have its standard uh, on, on the vehicle. But 93% was available on 2018s. So one of the challenges shops have that I've heard is they don't know how to identify. But it's really important, in my opinion, that one of the first steps up front during the repair planning process, the blueprinting process, is to identify any and all ADAS-related technologies on the vehicle. That's why an OEM pre-scan with an OEM tool can help because it will identify all that capability. For example, Lexus and Toyota, AEB standard 2017. Ford, 2020, all of its cars in 2020 will be equipped with ADAS. Nissan, again, 2018 and a half, Altimus, Leafs, Maxima, Verano, Pathfinder, Rogues, Centro, all AEB, blind spot monitoring, and traffic alert. Honda, same thing, all their vehicles from 2018 on. So what's that mean? That means all of these vehicles, but it is have radar, lidar, cameras, and ultrasound, um, but may include infrared and lasers as well. So all of that technology is on the vehicle. That that technology is pretty complicated, pretty complex. And again, it's much, in my opinion, it's more complex than your typical computer systems because it's actually make making decisions on braking, acceleration, and steering. ADAS and collision repair, what does it mean? Well, one of the things that scares me is from CCC's own data, current year in newer, only 1.9% of all repairs show calibration claim. Now, we already know 2017s, 2018s, 2019s, um, most of them are going to re require some kind of calibration. So it's really important um, for the shops to understand, identify that calibration up front, and make sure it gets done. Now, here's what's going to happen. Calibrations are going to become much more mainstream, and all of a sudden, we're going to hear this. Well, we're increasing severity on the vehicles. Well, guess what? Don't have a choice. It needs to be done. It's a safety-related solution, safety-related repair that needs to be done on the vehicle. Now, the good news is there's more and better tools and technology coming to help shops perform ADAS repairs and calibrations. So, an ADAS calibration is required. Number one, if you replace an ADAS sensor, R and R and R and R and I and R and R it, it's attached to a sensor, or before or after wheel alignment. And today, this is rarely being done in our industry. 
Here's an example on a Honda. If, if and this regards to their wave radar aiming, if the radar is removed and installed or replaced, must have calibration. Collision in the front end must have calibration. All the ones in yellow are telling you you must do a calibration after these occur. Multifunction camera on a Honda. If the unit is replaced or installed, windshield is removed or installed, vehicle is involved in the collision, or should be performed after a wheel in. Another Honda. Blind spot. After removing or installing, after repairing or replacing body panels where the radar is mounted. Again, requirement for calibration. Lane watch, Honda. Removed or installed. Mirror or is removed or installed. Passenger side mirror. Cover is removed or installed. Door position adjusted. Side door removed or installed. Again, all requirements for calibration. Toyota. Anytime a bumper cover or a grill is removed, reinstalled, replaced, or needs a wheel alignment, the millimeter wave radar sensor should be calibrated. Toyota, remove a front bumper cover. If it's replaced or installation position changed, or if the sensor is removed or replaced, or becomes misaligned, or is impacted, must have a calibration. Nissan, front radar, mandatory calibration. If the sensor is shifted, removed, reinstalled, or jolted, keyword jolted in the collision. Nissan, a round view monitor, mandatory if it's removed, installed, or replaced. So why is recalibration so important? Well, here's an example of an AEB braking test at 25 miles an hour. At the baseline, if the car is properly calibrated, you can see the impact speed upon automatically emergency braking is zero. Left alignment off by a little bit, impact speed zero. Middle alignment off by six-tenths of a degree, impact five miles an hour. Right alignment, six-tenths of a degree off, impact speed 20 miles an hour. So just because I have the equipment on the car, and remember, most of your ADAS technology does not, if it's miscalibrated, does not produce a DTC. So that's why it needs to be checked. Here's an example of a case study on a 2019 Altima where the issue was invisible to a scan tool. This is a national rental car. It had ProPilot Assist, which is their ADAS platform. Everything was turned on. After the, after the collision, the customer took the car. After some driving and traffic began to stop ahead, but the vehicle didn't pick it up. So the vehicle ahead of this, this car was stopping, but it's the automatic emergency braking wasn't working. Ten minutes later, ten minutes later, on the dash, they received this message. Ten minutes after they got to pick the car up, not available, front radar blocked. Now, again, don't know who did the repairs, but here's why. Here's what the good sensor looked like, supposed to look like, and here's what the damage sensor looked like. That damage there caused the vehicle not to operate correctly. Toyota calibrations, again, front camera, just the cal calibrated Toyota front camera. The repair procedures is 16 pages long. It requires special tools. You mean you have to have good lighting in your in your in your shop. You have to have a level floor, and you need to have at least 100 square foot in front of the car. There's there's the visual on what you need to set up for calibrations. And your towel.
tolerance is three millimeters. Now, the problem for all, all of you on the call is every one of these systems is different. They have different number of features. They operate differently. They kick in at different speeds. Um, and so, in my opinion, I believe most shops are going to have to work, work towards specialization of Asian vehicles versus domestic vehicles versus Euro vehicles because I do not believe because of this, the technology and the changes coming that a general collision repair facility will be able to keep up with all of the different changes. So how does Aztec fit in? Who is Aztec? How do we fit in? And how do we help? Well, Aztec, part owned by Copart, part owned by Kinderhook Industries, a private equity firm in New York. Having Copart as an investor is great because we can get as many cars as we want to do testing to make sure our, our solutions work. We have one transformative purpose, and it's to protect people's lives by ensuring the proper repair of automotive systems. We've grown over the last two years from 50 to 600 employees, and a really important thing to remember is our team has done over 1 million diagnostic service requests, completed one mil over 1 million diagnostics on crashed vehicles. There's no other company in the world that has done that many diagnostics on crashed vehicles. That gives us a lot of experience on what to look for and how to diagnose electronics on crash vehicles, which is much different than a vehicle that comes in fully on lymph mode. We have four services we offer. Remote, plug in our device, we have a technician remote, connects to the car via the internet, connects it with OEM tool, will help you perform a diagnosis and make recommendations. If your shop's big enough, we will put a technician in your shop to help you perform those services. You need to do between 175 and 200 hours a month. If for some reason our remote technician cannot help you, help you diagnose and repair the vehicle, we can send the mobile technician out, put hands and eyes on the car. And last but not least, our mobile techs have the ability to do some on-site calibration in your stores. We also have calibration centers in Texas, Jacksonville, Florida, Chicago, and soon to be Las Vegas. What are we doing? Well, we're solving industry challenges. Number one, we buy all the OEM tools. We have over 500 OEM tools and over 400 technicians. And so you get our device, you plug in the tool when you need us, and then you use our, if we connect you to an OEM tool and to a certified uh, technician. So we're solving two problems. We're giving you access to the most expensive tools. If you were to buy all the tools in the, if you were to buy a Mercedes-Benz tool, it's over $30,000. Plus, we're, with all the technicians, we're helping you solve a technician shortage. Also, by the fact that we're helping you diagnose and repair the electronics properly, we're helping you solve a liability issue. And last but not least, now that we're offering calibrations, we now can help your business perform calibrations. We have our mobile techs are now in 37 different markets ranging from Miami, Florida, all the way up to Seattle, from Baltimore down to San Francisco, and, and most places in between. So again, if our remote technicians can't solve the problem, we can sell, send a mobile tech on site to solve it. Presently, we have about 4,500 to 5,000 customers in North America. And now we're getting ready to release a mobile app, which will allow you to do all of the services that Access Aztec can provide you. You do your remote service, you can request on-site mobile, you can request on-site mobile calibrations, and last but not least, you can request mobile glass calibrations. So, wrapping it up. Today's and tomorrow's vehicles are full of electronic sensors and cameras, and this will only increase. Scanning, I hope you now understand, is very different than diagnostics. Scan is like an x-ray, diagnosing that x-ray is where our expertise is. The OEMs are becoming much more restricted regarding their access to their computer and safety systems. Hope I was able to show you that the aftermarket tools are not as accurate, particularly on newer model vehicles. The ADAS-related technologies require mobile calibration types, multiple calibration types with very tight tolerances. And last but not least, we believe here at Aztec, we are more than positioned to help you 
help your repairers with all aspects of vehicle electronics, diagnostics, repairs, and calibrations. With that said, I'm now going to open it up, Melissa, for any questions. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to type in the chat box? Give them a second. So do you have plans to continue to expand the mobile techs around the country as needed? Is that how uh, you're adding locations for that? We're, we're, yeah, the, the answer, Melissa, yes, we are planning to continue to add mobile technicians. Our plan is to be in 55 metropolitan statistical areas by the end of 2019. Today we're in 37. So we will be expanding, correct. Okay. Um, there's a question. Can you explain the cost structure? Sure. So cost structure is pretty simple. The, the cost of an Aztec device is $2,500. RDA members receive a 15% discount. Um, and then on any initial diagnostic request, the first request, the price is $119.95. So whether that's the first time you do, first time on a VIN, and the subsequent, any subsequent diagnostic service performed is 50 bucks. So if you do the first diagnostic service uh, on a pre, it's 119.95. If you do the post with an Aztec, it's 50 for a total of 169.95. Now, on that subject, most of our customers, 90 plus percent of our customers, also add a 0.5 in the front and a 0.5 in the back. So this can be and should be a profit center. Okay. Uh, when will the scan tool be wireless? It is wireless today. Okay. We don't. We, we recommend using it wirelessly. Uh, by the way, it's not a scan tool. It's a connector. It connects the car to an OEM scan tool. But with that said, the the, the Aztec device is wireless, and we recommend you can use wireless on pre scans. But anytime there's a scan that may require programming, we, we, we strongly recommend a direct connection via CAT5 because in today's shops, in any shop with a, with a garage door going up, compressor kicking in, welder kicking in, uh, it can affect the wireless. And the last thing we want to do during the programming of a module is lose the internet connectivity, which would fry the module. Any other questions? Here's one. Uh, what is the cost uh, for the mobile tech if needed? Depends. Good question. Depends. Um, it's going to depend on the service we perform. Um, a, a, a regular scan would cost exactly what we charge remotely. But if they do it, if they let's say they have to remove a dash, it's going to be by the hour. Let's say they have to do programming. It's going to be based on whatever whatever type of programming time it takes. Let's say they need to do a calibration. It's going to depend on the vehicle. So it's, it, we're going to base it. Typically, our, our, our mobile rates are based on the local mobile labor rates. So they should be no different from a, a cost per hour than what's, what's going on in your local market. But the time it takes to perform the service will depend on what we're doing. Okay. Um, well, back to the wireless um, question, I guess. Some Hondas require the vehicle to be driven for a reset. How do you stay connected and drive the vehicle? Good question. So today, what we recommend the customers is to use a hotspot. Uh, a Verizon or an AT&T or a Sprint or whatever, use a hotspot. Uh, we do have a new version of our Aztec device um, in, in development that includes LTE connectivity within the device. My guess is that'll be available sometime in Q4. What are your advantages over AirPro? Oh, well, everybody's got their pros and cons. Um, first of all, we only use OEM tools. And I would strongly recommend, if you're looking for a comparison of what makes us different than AirPro, uh, simply take off the cover of the, the case 
and what you'll find inside are two aftermarket um, devices. You'll find an auto ingenuity tool, and you'll find the Drew Tech J2534. Um, we only use the OEM factory tools, so we do not use any aftermarket tools whatsoever. Again, I strongly suggest lifting the cover of your uh, the air probe case, take a look inside. Um, so that's one of the major differences. Okay. Um, so another back to the wireless. So the unit is wireless, but you recommend connecting it to a Cat5 cable? Well, the, the, the unit can do can, can connect to the wireless connectivity in your in your building, so it has the ability to connect to your wireless today. But on on post scans or or programming, we strongly recommend you plug a Cat5 cable into the device again because wireless can be flaky sometimes, and we don't want to. Um, damage anything with the module. So today, just to be crystal clear, today the, the device does not include the LTE capability of what's going to be coming out later in the year, but it can connect to any wireless network. So again, in your shop, if your wireless network is available in the shop, we can connect to it. In the car, if you're driving the Honda, we can, if you have a hotspot, we can connect device, the device to the wireless hotspot. But again, any type of programming to be done in a vehicle, we recommend, strongly recommend uh, a Cat5 connection. Okay. Okay, let's see. When will the LTE be available? Oh, the plan is it should be available sometime in the fourth quarter of 2019. Okay. Any more questions? All right, well, we will follow up by sending everyone on the uh, presentation. Um, Frank's information, it's also in front of you here, but we'll, we'll go ahead and I'll email that to everybody. And, uh, you know, shortly we'll uh, post the presentation on the YouTube channel so you can go back and uh, review any of the material that was covered. Uh, thank you, Frank. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. And continue to send us your suggestions for future webinars, and we'll be in touch with uh, future training opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.